question. All right, so performance. Uh, Mercy. Don't have to go through this. This is just for you guys to know what hardware we use. Very modest hardware. Four node clusters for all this performance data here. Uh, double uh, two dual socket, 24 cores on each, 256 gig of memory, two four, 400 gig P3700s for the, for the cache tier. And for each host, so <coughs> and six 800 gig uh, S3700, all right? 10 gig network, obviously. Shall I move on? So first of all, no regression between 6.1 and 6.2, even though we have all those check checksums on, OK? That's one. Many metrics here doesn't matter. We have two transactional uh, cases, and then we have a, a view planner scores here. As you can see, practically, there is no difference. Even in some cases, the latency is better because we have optimized a little bit our data path in 6.2, OK? Let's move to the more interesting stuff. What is the performance impact of all those space efficiency features, OK? And by performance, I don't mean only uh, like IOPS and latencies, but also CPU utilization. What is the impact on your uh, consolidation ratios? That's the important thing, right? So at a very high level, the summary is that we have substantially reduced uh, uh, TCO. And uh, while we're retaining high IOPS, low latencies, with minimal CPU overhead. And even that, you use that extra CPU, that little extra CPU, only when you need it. You don't need to go and provision like and pin eight vCPUs and 32 gigs of memory just in case you need them. All right? Another sizing headache. So let me go into the details. Let me start with the VDI, View Planner. I'm going to go quickly through this. Tell me when you want me to stop. The legend, I hope, makes sense. 6.1 is the base, 6.2 with checksums. Then we have 6.2 with RAID 5, deduplication, and then RAID 5 and deduplication combined. That's going to be the legend throughout this presentation. Okay? And shorter bars are better. So here, shorter bars are better. These are latencies perceived by the end user doing a combination of things like saving files, opening files, writing and doing something. This is the view planner traditional scores. So Yeah, that's barely noticeable. That's yeah, like the, the, 15%. Yeah, and forget even about this. This is not very I.O. intensive, the group A. This is the more interesting part. We go, the latency for the end user, the human that saves a big file, Word file, goes from 4.3 seconds to 5.1 seconds with everything on. OK? Now, what does it mean in CPU? Look, for virtual desktop, you want to pack as many VMs as you can, right? Here, actually, the numbers were with 145 virtual desktops per host. Look where we were. With, we are at 0.5. So the blue bars are the overall CPU used on the host by everything. And you see, we have maxed them out, OK? From that, we use 0.5% of CPU for vSAN in 6.1 with the checksums and all these things went to 0.7 in 6.2. And from 0.7, we went to 1.4. It almost or, tripled. Or, or, sorry? It almost tripled. Yes, from what, <laughs> from what starting point, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you see what I mean, right? We, essentially, your, your virtual desktop consolidation ratios are not affected. This is the most important thing. You don't have to like dedicate I don't know, one quarter of your, of your server to running this, the storage workload. OK, with me? And now, <laughs> this is actually, I was surprised about this. And don't, don't hold me, you know, don't go into too scientific into this, but I asked our performance guys to run this test three times because I couldn't believe the savings. This is in the same test to say, well, yeah, let me see how much we are saving, right? This is, these are linked clones, OK? Four times 145, OK? And after the link clones, this is how much space we're consuming on its host, physical space. And look where that thing went. With the duplication, which is extremely effective, and then RAID 5 also helps a bit. But the point here is that even though those are the, it's the one base disk and the deltas, even the deltas have many common blocks. 
well, after Patch Tuesday, a lot. Yes, but these were uh, those are pristine. We didn't do <laughs> lots of uh, lots of uh, patches and things like that on those link clones. Oh, so this isn't this this is worse than real world. So we, we run we run the view the view planner on them. No patches that doesn't include. So it's like writing files and yeah. things like that, right? And then. You oh, but it's writing a lot of the same files because it's the same view planner for all 145. Perhaps. Yeah, yes. But look, people write a lot of the same things. But yeah, anyway, no. It, my, my point is, like, I did not expect this. It's pretty good, right? I'll take this as, as, a, as a bonus, but as we discussed offline before, we need to have better yeah. benchmarks for space efficiency. And this is a problem in the industry. I admit it. And we need to perhaps join in the community to do something about that. Now, let's go into some of the transactional workloads. Guys, today I'm not giving you hero numbers. I would be very happy to do that. Last year we talked about some of the scalability properties of vSAN. Back to the, what we were discussing with Justin a few minutes ago, we saw how we scale with a number of costs as well with the number of devices. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you what these features mean for the end user. So that's, I'm going to focus on realistic use cases. So I have here two transactional workloads. A DVD store, which is a TPC-like workload. It's like a an uh, uh, online store where you order DVDs and they ship them and keep track of customers and things like that. And then I have a brokerage workload, which is a traditional uh, TPC-like workload, which is a, 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 a stock broker where you get you know, uh, trading requests by customers. They do the trades. They, they provide an, uh, analytics. And they, do like a, they, in, they integrate with uh, the stock market uh, systems and things like that. So what do I want to say here? This, this, this thing is not very IOPS demanding. It's quite a bit of CPU, has large <coughs> IOPS, but not many IOPS per second. The, the payloads are pretty big, though. You see here, modest IOPS, there is practically no difference in performance for the user. If I had such a workload, I would not even think twice. I would turn everything on right, and be, you know, be happy. In the case of the brokers now, where the Smaller IOS typically, higher IOS per second. Here you see a noticeable difference going from like 40,000 IOPS per host, and we're not maxing out the system here by far, 40,000 IOPS down to 25,000 IOPS per host with uh, everything on. So here, as, a, as an end user, I may make you know, <coughs> a decision. Do I want to turn on any of the, the duplication, RAID 5? This is up to me, and what, but at least you know, I can really anticipate. And you know, it's not falling off the cliff, right? But it's you know, falling. No, it's not the, deduplication looks like it's got about a 25% penalty. Yes, right. In this case, the duplication is expensive. And this guy is not very duplicatable either, even though I don't remember the details. Actually, it is. We'll see those in a minute. But yes, actually, we do quite a bit. Anyway, we'll see the numbers. But yes, the duplication has a, has a penalty here. Yes, Chris. So do you do any testing to show what happens when you're in recovery mode? Yes. To, to ah, yes. I have a slide. So, uh, later, Sorry. you see, this, this guy said, has pretty large payload. So the latencies hover somewhere between uh, 2 and 2.7 uh, milliseconds, not affected by any of these data services. Here, again, yeah. Well, as expected, you see an obvious increase in latency. You go from below one uh, millisecond uh, uh, with uh, the baselines up to about 6.5 milliseconds with everything on. Again, yes, that's expected, what we, even what we saw in the previous page. It's your call, all right? I got to say, given this and the fact that you're doing deduplication on a per disk group, I'm starting to think that I'd like to be able to turn it off on a disk group and put that application that's doing a lot of small IOs on that disk group so it won't take the, the latency penalty. Yeah, let's, uh, then that gets into all those. It, it's creating a nerd process. knob, and some people will set them wrong. I and then just say, oh, man, do you, you, you want me to now think about yet another parameter to configure? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, well, I'm, those are the. <laughs> I'm, certain, I'm yeah, certainly not asking to change yeah. the defaults. Right, right. So, uh, <laughs> CPU utilization. Let's, these are transactional workloads. Look at this. This guy who is not, he does his own, is 
one quite CPU demanding, but not in terms of the I.O. processing. Doesn't make any difference. We go from like 3% uh, to 4.2%, okay. right? <laughs> Come on. Here, you, I mean, this guy is really beefy, right? With, so we go from using about, I don't remember, that was like 12% 12, 12 of the overall CPU for vSAN. We go from that to about 17 and a half, 18 percent. Now, this is interesting. Yeah, I you just noticed why? that. You know why? Can you guess? No. Because of those latencies, we cannot push as many IOs. Ah. And the processing cost actually goes down. And that's why down. the CPU goes down. Right. Right, so the CPU cost per IOP is about the same, but you exactly. can't. But we have less IOs. Yeah. So, um, savings, I don't want to go much into this, right? Yeah. I mean, this guy duplicates about, you know, uh, eight, 75%. This is a more realistic, actually, data set. I don't even know what this TPCE data, toolkit data set is. So, okay, let's move on. Chris, here, this is for you. Sorry. Okay, so, or. All nice, right? So we have many questions. Okay, under normal circumstances, everything is well. What happens? Well, things break, right? So here, I try to create a pretty uh, nasty situation. First of all, uh, when we are right, cast fills up at some point after a period of time when the system is fresh. Finally, your right cast fills up, and then you start destaging. And you go from a situation, look at the blue line only, please. From a situation where your, your IOPS and your latencies are pretty stable, then you start seeing a little bit of a jittery behavior because, like, like this, because of the, all the destaging that is taking place, right? So, okay, let's do the following. When the, your destaging starts, at the same time, kill a host. Let's see what we do there, right? So, this is. We, we took us a little bit of effort to time all these things, but here is the moment at minute 60, after this normal operation of your system here, where those two events happen at the same time. This is a, a four node cluster and we kill one host, okay? So here you see that this, uh, these are operations per minute for the DVD store workload. Uh, this is, again, the user perceived performance of the system, okay? And this is not zero, right? This is 100. And that's 160. So you see that the, uh, this is uh, operations per minute. So you see that operations per minute drop from about 158 down for a few minutes to 112, 113. And then stabilized somewhere between 130, 140. This is the period, the gray period, where we do a recovery of the data that used to be lived to on, on, the died, on the dead host across now the surviving four hosts in the cluster. So there is a resynchronization going on. The resynchronization traffic is, is shown with, by the grade area. So as you see, the performance is actually dropped a little bit, but is well contained, like no more than 25%. And in a typical case, it's more like you know, 10, 15%. And then here, resynchronization finishes. You see things recover. And this is the regular jitter now because of that the stage that I was talking about plus DVD store, if you see it, because the databases grow over time, has a tendency to go down anyway. And it's down a little bit because now you have four active nodes instead of five. Yes, that is true. Yes. So that, does that answer some yeah, of your yeah, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So the, the point I want to make, I know you, know you like the details of this. We have a scheduler in the system, distributed scheduler, that throttles the resynchronization traffic down to about 25% to 20%, which is actually what we see, thankfully, <laughs> uh, when other traffic is going on, right? So because we don't want to penalize the regular I.O. of the application, right? So, we, so what we do is we trade off trying to resynchronize as, as, as fast as you can without penalizing too much your application. That's what the, yeah. the, the schedule does. And obviously, without having too many nerd knobs, you know, some people might want to control that and say, have it higher or low, but you know, again, it comes back to how many nerd jobs do you want to put in? We, we have an advanced all configuration I want. And all for those guys, yes. Okay. You can turn that number from the default of 20, 20 or 25 
<laughs> but you know, you have to be careful. But you know that you just said people like doing that sort of thing, so you know, if people would want to do it, it's up to them. A few quick comments, because I really want to give this guy a few minutes. So, business critical applications, as Jan being said, this is actually the most common use case on Visa and these days are business critical applications. We have support for all the main things like uh, SAP, Microsoft, uh, Oracle. Like we support all those cluster Microsoft products. We have uh, uh, what do we do? Um, we have white papers. We have reference architectures. All these things, our customers deploy them widely. We even and I uh, actually working closely with SAP to certify HANA on Visan. Actually, all the tests pass. I, I cannot publicly put this up here, but our latencies are in, in a very modest hardware, is, are in the range of 600 to 650 microseconds. We're well below the TDI. Uh, uh, that, uh, but these guys say, what is this HCI? We qualify hardware. So, no, guys, we are the new generation of storage, which is hardware and, and software, right? And the, also the application around the same hardware. Said, so, no, 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 this is, we don't understand. So we're going through this process of, and not only us, actually, here we are in the same, on the same side with many of our competitors in the industry. To so you're saying the SAP AP. guys are more curmudgeonly than me? I'm not going no. to comment on that. No. <laughs> I'm not comment on that while you are in the room, Howard. Let's move on. Yeah. So performance oh, now, uh, transactional performance with a real workload. This is Oracle Rack on a four node hybrid cluster, hybrid, right? I, if I were, if it were me, I would configure this with all flat. But say, okay, let's do that on on a not very favorable hardware hybrid. So we have to size your your classes and everything, right? The problems we said before. Oracle Rack, one Oracle VM running on its node with some substantial uh, databases, uh, things like uh, I don't remember the numbers. Uh, some of the nodes like half a terabyte per per node or something like that. Okay, so. What I want to stress here is two things. The performance is very good. Like we get like 287,000 uh, transactions per minute out of this across the four nodes. But more important for me is that the, the, the performance is very dependable. The standard deviation, which is what you sh we should be looking for those things, is very low. The maximum is 331. It's not going like that. You, you can have predictable performance even with this unfavorable hardware configuration. <clears throat> Plus, I have here a graph that shows how we scale. We have the four node cluster, and then we put one rack <coughs> VM, then two rack VMs on two different hosts, three, four. And you see we go from 155 transactions per minute to 287 <coughs> transactions per minute. So it scales. Okay. Now, many of our customers deploy this kind of databases on stretched clusters for things that, you know, obvious reasons, like high availability. So how does stretched clustering affect the performance? So I have here, I, I'm showing again, there's the same benchmark I saw in the previous uh, slide, so the swing, swing bench with Oracle Rack. And in this case, we have, uh, it's a, I don't remember exactly what is the, the, the number of nodes, but it's the relative scaling that matters anyway. So we have the baseline of a regular cluster in the same data center, and then we have stretch cluster with one millisecond latency, stretch cluster with 2.2, and with 4.2. Why are performance guys use that 0.2? Don't ask me. I don't know. So the point I want to make here is that you have a very uh, expected, reasonable performance degradation in terms of transactions per second as you increase the latency between your two data sites. And interesting, another way to put this is, if I have a stress cluster in typical metro distances where we can achieve easily one millisecond round trip times, right? This is what our, actually our, our customers in, uh, you know, in lower Manhattan, uh, Hoboken place, they have much lower than one millisecond. You get like 80% uh, of your original performance. And you have now R, uh, RPO equals zero protection against the failure of a site. Okay, this is the main point to take away. 